to someday preach in Mount Olivet. So it's just kind of exciting to have that opportunity today. So um, if some of this is going to be redundant. Most of you have known me my whole life, so you already know who I am and where I'm from. But for those of you that don't know me, because there are a few, uh, my name's Allison Burkhart, and my parents are Barb and Charlie Burkhart. And I grew up in this church, and it is where I came to know the Lord, and I came to know what Jesus looks like. Um, and many of you are a really integral part of that, um, and it means a lot to me to be here and be with you today. Um, so I went to Palmyra High School, lived, grew up in Taylor, and I went to Culver Stockton College. So I got a nonprofit arts degree, and like many young people, when I was in my final year of school, I was thinking about my five-year plan. You know, all of your teachers talk to you about make, setting goals and making plans, so I had the five-year plan. Um, and as many of you guys know, when you make a plan for yourself, God says, that's so funny. I've got something else in mind for you. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you today um, kind of my story. Some of you know bits and pieces of it. I don't know that any of you know all of it. But, um, and I'm going to apologize right now. I'm probably going to cry because I did in the two previous churches. So you'll just have to bear with me. Um, so my first step in my five-year plan was going to grad school after that to get that good job with that good salary and then eventually once i was done moving around and transitioning to uh, eventually find the right person get married and have the american dream 1.5 kids the dog the right house the home etc cetera, etc cetera. so phase one grad school my last year of college, one of my professors had talked to me about um, this uh, program that existed. It does not anymore, unfortunately, um, where I could go interview for several grad programs at the same time. So they would all be there. I could meet with them, and then they would make offers. And the best part of it was it was full ride, so it was free. So I had gotten into my second choice, which was Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, which my father affectionately calls the armpit of America, in which he said, Allison, why on earth would you want to go to the armpit of America? Because it had a really great program and it was free. So I get there and I did really well in my classes and got along with my coworkers great. Um, there were, they would only take five in my program every year. So I was really close with my classmates, um, have some dear friends to this day from that. However, I also learned just how sheltered my upbringing in this small rural farming community was. Um, have any of you been to Detroit? Show of hands. Okay. So I was there 99 to 02, and the main streets downtown were, for the most part, developed. There were a lot of what I referred to as pimp shops with like flashy crazy shoe, uh, suits and the boots with the heels that would have fish in them and things like that. Um, and then you go a block any other direction and it just looked like a war zone because um, it had never rebuilt from the riots in the 60s. So there were a lot of things going on that I'd only heard about. And I lived at the end of what is at the time called Cass Corridor. I don't think it is quite what it was. I don't think it is now what it was then. But it was a 10 block stretch that even the police wouldn't go into. You could, you could call them, but they wouldn't show up. Um, so it was a pretty interesting existence. Um, our first day there, the police pre precinct on campus gathered everyone in all the grad programs together in this big room and told us how you walk down the street. So first rule was you don't look anybody in the eye because that is an invitation. Um, second rule is you don't go anywhere by yourself ever, a minimum of three people, no matter the time of day. And females don't go anywhere ever, no matter how large your group is, without at least two males. So that kind of limits your ability, obviously. Um, so that first year, I experienced a lot of interesting things. Um, another thing that uh, kind of defined our neighborhood a little bit was there was a state-run mental health facility about two blocks down the street from my office. And they had run out of money um, about five years before I moved there. And these are people that are homeless, they have no family, no insurance. 
So they literally walk them out the front door and close the doors. And so you're talking people with schizophrenia and all sorts of mental health issues, no longer with access to medication, nowhere to live, et cetera. So they were frequently around. Some of them lived um, behind where I worked. A couple lived near where um, I lived outdoors. Um, so it was, it was an interesting existence. Um, at one point, I was, there was also just a lot of crime. At one point, I was chased into my apartment um, by a serial rapist. Now, I can't, un uh, I can't outrun anybody. So um, I just kind of knew that this wasn't a good situation. And I later, I said, I just think that God put two angels on my shoulder that picked me up and flew me into my apartment. And my roommate heard me. I guess I was yelling. I did not know that. And she called the police, and um, based on two things that I told them, they walked in with a sketch composite and said, is this him? And I was like, yes, that's him. They're like, okay, he's extremely dangerous. He knows where you live. <laughs> I never saw him again. But um, then also, because of the large homeless population, um, the economy was terrible. There were no jobs. There weren't even fast food restaurants around there because they would get, um, they would get robbed. So convenience stores, restaurants, those did not exist there. And... So on Fridays at about five o'clock in my work building, the dance floor was in that building. So there were showers. So um, a lot of people would try to sneak in before the building closed at five because then they would have a warm place to sleep. They could do their laundry. They could take showers, et cetera. Um, and then occasionally I worked till five. So occasionally I would get stopped um, coming down the elevator with people trying to stop me in it. And um, so I'll, needless to say, my first year was just acclimating to what life was like other than beautiful, wonderful Taylor, Missouri, <laughs> where these things don't happen. Um, my second year, I was really looking for a church home. So I found this beautiful, huge uh, UMC church within walking distance. And um, I get there, and again, I find myself just completely out of my element because instead of praying for our friends that are having surgery or um, you know, family members that have passed away, um, they were praying for things that I'd never even thought of before. Like, I'm praying that I can find a way to get my electricity turned on before winter sets in. Or I'm praying that the food pantry will let me come through again so I have food to feed my kids. Um, and so it's, I struggled at my young age to find a place that I fit in that way. Um, so my last year in the armpit of America, uh, tragedy kind of struck our family. Most of you know the, the most of this story. Um, in a four to six month period, my great uncle Sill died. My father's only sibling died. Emily, my niece, was diagnosed with cancer at two and a half, and my grandmother's congestive heart failure was getting the better of her, and we knew it was just a matter of time. Um, also, my last year is when I had to do this huge project and presentation and defend my project and why I should be allowed to have this master's degree bestowed on me. Um, luckily, my professors were really understanding and they let me get away with like a 30 minute conversation <laughs> and let me graduate given everything that we'd gone through. Um, so phase one grad school is done, right? So we're moving on to phase two, the job, good salary. So once again, I told God what I wanted. I wanted to find a job in a city on the water. At the time, I hated Chicago. And God said, you're going to Chicago. Um, it is a city on the water. So that's where I ended up. I was in the West Suburbs. And uh, there were great people. And it was a really good experience for me. Um, what I didn't know at the time was I was in way over my head. I was given a job I never should have been given at that age. Because basically, I was having to supervise people in their 40s and 50s. And I also learned very quickly, so this was a large community theater, I also learned very quickly that um, a lot of people in theater believe life and death, believe it's life and death. The sun rises and sets on theater. Um, that is more important than family, it's more important than all of these other things. Well, that's not how I was raised and that's not what I believe. So I quickly realized this is not the career path I wanted to be on. Um, and youth ministry had always been my side thing. I'd gotten involved with a student ministry in uh, the West Suburbs, and that was my passion. So I started looking for something different anyway and decided that arts was just going to be my side hobby that I poured into. And 
Um, thankfully, I had started looking because my last year at the theater, my um, board director, it changed every year, we had a new board director every year, was a really controlling man um, who I don't believe knows the Lord. Um, and it ended with me leaving before my two weeks was up. Um, I ended up locked in my office having to call people to come get him out of the building because he'd gotten so physically aggressive and out of control. Um, so we're moving on to this new position that I had gotten at North Park University in the city um, in the Center for Youth Ministry Studies there. I was the assistant director. So I was really excited because I'm getting away from this horrible place that I was in and moving on um, to this new position, my calling, and I'm really excited about it. So phase three should come, right? Because this, this is the good job and with the good salary that I believed was my phase two. So phase three was family. Well, because of my experiences and them primarily happening from men, I was only comfortable keeping, and this is anybody, at arm's length. So settling in some roots and developing a community that stuck was really difficult for me. I was much more comfortable being by myself, and that was just completely contrary to what I was taught and what I know and really the heart of the church. Um, well, because of that, then I couldn't have the American dream, the 1.5 kids. But I love kids. Um, my mom started babysitting Heather Poppy when I was, I don't know, five years old maybe. And, you know, I'm the youngest of five, um, so I never got the little, the little brother or sister. However, I love my role. I'm the baby, and I'm still the baby to this day, and I will keep it that way very happily. <laughs> um, my Lee J still... All I have to do is say, Lee J, like that, and he'll drop and drive wherever. Um, I don't make him do that, but he will. Um, but uh, I discovered just how much I loved children uh, through Heather being in our life. Um, and I doubt she knows that. But anyway, so that uh, evolved into me becoming really involved in children's ministries here. Like as soon as many of you guys would let me um, be involved with your kids. And then, of course, getting to spend a lot of time with Whitney and Lacey and Jeremy and some of the other church kids um, just evolved that love even more. Well, so I'm really involved in my student ministry and I was thriving there, but my commute to my new job from where I was living in the suburbs was two hours and that was just too much to deal with. So I moved into the city, but that also meant that I had to break with my church that had been, um, been my, my strong home. Um, so changing seasons, I move in, I'm Moving to the city, I'm working at North Park, I'm living into my calling and my purpose. I thrived, I was really successful, and I was getting to meet and work with these amazing ministry people that I kind of held up on these pedestals, like authors of books and curriculum and major theological um, thinkers in the world right now and all these incredible experiences and putting on innovative conferences and training events for youth and youth workers and um, from the outside looking in, it should have been just about per perfect. Um, by this point, I'm about 10, 11 years into my five-year plan. <laughs> that has not turned out the way I thought. Um, and I, the honeymoon had worn off for sure in my role at North Park. Um, because I was working with so many people at high levels of ministry, um, publishers, um, denomination leaders, not only for regions of the U.S., but for the whole country or the whole world, uh, I got to see the dark side, and it's pretty ugly. Um, if there's anything I learned from there, it's how much you need to pray for your pastor and how much you need to give them the benefit of the doubt because of how much they're up against. Um, there was a lot of, uh, like, petty backstabbing and climbing, trying to um, beat this person out of this job. There was stealing of prop, uh, intellectual property. So someone might have developed this great new curriculum and we're talking to a publisher and then somebody else would run to a publisher first so they could make the money off of it. And it really just burned me out and turned me off to full-time ministry. Um, I was going to seminary at the time and I had wanted to go into Christian formation or youth ministry full-time. And at that point I was like, I, mm -mm, this isn't something I wanna do. Um, be, if I have to deal with that day to day. Um, so with all of this going on, I entered what I now call my dark period. Um, I just felt like I was doing everything the way I was supposed to. 
I was, I was involved. I was going to church. I had friends that weren't, that were, you know, doing everything you're taught you're not supposed to, but they're just doing so well. And I didn't understand why God had left me. My world was just rocked. Everything I'd been taught and everything I knew was just turned upside down. And some of you know this, some of you may not. I may think you don't, and you're just smarter than that because you know me so well, but I'm a perfectionist. Um, I don't like letting people see what's going on in here and in here, and it's really hard for me. Um, and that's why I'm cheerful today is because it's hard for me to share that still. Um, and the only thing I could figure was that my issues, my problems just weren't that important in the grand scheme of things. Um, and I didn't think they were compared to things like, you know, homeless schizophrenics with no access to medication or um, friends going through um, trouble getting pregnant or things like that. And one of my friends, Kyle, I met him at Camp Jota. He, uh, he's a physician and he was in his, one of his last years of residency and he said to me, Allison, your anxiety has gotten so big and so prominent and it's taken such a big place in your life that it is affecting your day-to-day -day and your decision-making and you have to get help. So at that point, I realized I had to choose if I was gonna live or if I was gonna die. I hadn't told my dear friends, my two dear friends that have walked through with me through life, I hadn't told them any of that. Neither one of them knows that, that I had to make that choice, but I did. And because of my role at North Park, I'd worked with a lot of Christian counselors and firms, and I had one picked out that I really trusted, wonderful person, and he ended up um, putting me with a woman who named Inger, who I believe saved my life. Um, so I started working with her, and I experienced some healing for the first time. I learned um, what my value was and what I meant, um, and I was able to change relationships with my family members, um, my mom in particular. I had taken a lot of things out on um, because she was there, and I knew she wouldn't go anywhere. So I'm really grateful that I was able to change that relationship with her. Um, and one of the things I knew I was really missing was those roots, that family, that core. And I, and I missed kids. I really missed kids. So I began babysitting through a nannying agency. And it looks very different than it does here. Um, a lot of people up there have to travel for work, so both parents might have to be gone for three or four days at a time. So I um, became very close to a handful of families. And started staying with them, and yes, I was taking dogs to doggy daycare, um, as well as caring for the children, but <laughs> um, it worked out, because while the kids were at school, I would go to work, and so I really got to pour into these kids and these families, and um, in particular, I found that my niche is special needs, particularly autistic children, so my nanny agency began to um, recommend me for most of our families that had autistic children, and I just, I loved it. And I really became content with who I am and who I was and my singleness. I had a couple more years till I turned 40 at this point, and um, I really worked on accepting the fact that even if I were to meet somebody that I felt like I could commit to, I might not be able to have a child. I might struggle um, health-wise, there might be issues. So I, um, I became content with not being able to have any of my own. So everything's going good, right? Well, then my world got rocked again. Um, my, my college sweetheart came back into my life. He is not a social media person at all. <laughs> um, so I had not kept in touch. I didn't have a way to keep in touch with him. So I hadn't seen him since shortly after I moved to Detroit. And so things happened very quickly. They were very intense. It was like out of a movie. Um, I just couldn't believe this was happening to me because I, you know, I was ready now. I'd had this healing. I was ready. It's time. I just felt so certain that this was God's plan for me. Um, so he began talking to me about getting married and did we want to live here? Did we want to live there? And I wanted to live here. Um, I'd already had it in the back of my head that I wanted to move back here. I wanted to get some 
quality time with my parents um, while they're still able to do a lot of things still. So I began looking for a job here. Um, and since we were doing a relationship from a distance, there was a lot that I didn't see because he could choose what I saw and what I didn't. Um, what I learned was he was in a dark place. He was having a dark period. And it was um, about as bad as mine, um, but in different ways. But I'm not a quitter. I was committed, so I was going to work through this with him. Um, but ultimately, he ended up breaking things off. So at, shortly after that happened, I was offered a job here, so I took it. Because at that point, I, I'd already decided I was moving back, and I really needed my family. So I came back, um, took a job with a lower salary. I moved in with my parents, which I love, by the way. That's why I'm still living with them. It's turned out to be the biggest blessing. Um, and there are days I really, really hate my job because it's not what I want to do or what I feel called to. And so I've been back this week, actually, this last week. It's been two years. Um, and last year I turned 40. So leading up to that, there are times when I'm just like, I am 40, or I'm about to turn 40. I'm living with my parents. I have a job making half the salary I did before. <laughs> um, what do I have to show for my life? Can I get a vol my volunteer to read Psalm 23, 5 and 6, please? So I had to decide again, I had to make a choice. Um, one of the things that I would frequently get asked to teach on at conferences or um, training youth workers on was helping young people redefine what success looks like because the world's very different than it was. Um, the economy is very different. The goals of getting the good job and good salary right away out of high school or college are much lower than they used to be. So that's something I teach on. And I decided this is something I'm going to have to practice what I preach, so I made that choice. And so I went back through some of the things in my life. When I was in the armpit of America, <laughs> um, a couple of the things that God really, um, really taught me or really gave to me were a survival instinct and an intuitive awareness. My observational awareness would scare you. Um, I can tell before things are going to happen, and I like to joke that I can tell a snake a mile from a mile away. All I have to do is look at their eyes. Um, sometimes it's annoying. However, that survival instinct is what made me decide I was going to live instead of die. Um, and redefining that failure into success, God said, you're not a victim, Allison, but you're a survivor. Can I get my volunteer to read First Thessalonians 2, 11 through 12? So find, trying to find glory in my singleness because, you know, I've gotten to that place and now that's been taken away from me, so I think. Um, so God showed me that because of my singleness, I've gotten to be a part of other people's families in ways that I could not have been otherwise. I got to be the surrogate mom, the dog caretaker. You know me, I love dogs. So that was almost as much fun for me as the kids. Um, and so God redefining my uh, failure into a success was reminding me that I may not be a parent, but I'm a mother, I'm a big sister, and I'm a mentor to a lot of young people. In my broken engagement, I just was so humiliated. Um, and this group in this room did so much <laughs> to carry me through that, so thank you. Um, and God had to remind me, you know what? I was protecting you from something really dark, another dark period. And it prepared me to be here in a way for my best friend and for her to be here for me in a way that nobody else could. And I truly believe that was one of the reasons God brought me back here was so that I could walk alongside her and her me um, as we go through a pretty big life transition. Um, also, like I said before, getting that time back with my parents that I'd lost for so many years, that's really been one of the biggest gifts and blessings for me. 
Um, can I have my volunteer read 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 11? So that verse just, I feel like that's like my adult life mantra. <laughs> um, if I get to boast about being weak, I've got a lot to boast about, right? <laughs> um, but God told me, no, Allison, um, I'm going to redefine your weakness and tell you you're not straight weak, but you're really strong. So in what ways has God redefined your failures or your mistakes into something successful? And where was God at in that? I need somebody to share now. This is the interactive part. <laughs> In what ways has God taken your mistakes or what you feel like are failures and turned them into one of your successes? Me too, Luke. Yeah. yeah, but we all have them, right? Um, now, the, the unfortunate thing is since we're human, we're flawed. Um, it'd be so easy if we could just look to our Bible and hear God. I always say, I'm like, God, I just need you to call me on my cell phone. So I'm really clear that's you and that's what you're telling me. Um, but God does show and tell us how we're successful and what we need to do to be successful. And one of the really important uh, ways he does that is through other people. So, um, because it's definitely not man's definition or culture's definition. It's not the job you have. It's not the salary you have. It's not where you live. It's loving Jesus first, other second, and yourself third. Um, can I have Jeremiah 29 11, please? My volunteer who has that one. So my prayer this week is that each of you can hear or see a way that God values you and that you can also be used as the voice of God to someone else. Would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you so much for um, the church, capital C, the one that you made for us to grow and learn and to worship you, Father. And just pray for everyone in this room and those of our community who aren't here, um, that you would... Uh, hear what's in their hearts and um, show them that when they're weak, they're made strong. We just ask for a good week as we move in this week, um, praying that we see and hear you everywhere we go. We ask this in your name. Amen.